Chapter 12 is going to pick up right where we left off in OCHEM 1 on the synthesis of alcohols. But instead of doing syntheses from alkenes, we're going to start doing reactions with carbonyl compounds. And pretty much from here on out, the majority of the chemistry that we do in OCHEM 2 is going to involve carbonyl compounds. So first, I want you to recall the carbonyl group. Remember that the carbonyl group is not really a functional group on its own, but it is part of many different functional groups. And therefore, we tend to use the word carbonyl a lot like an adjective. The carbon is sp2 hybridized, and the molecular geometry of the carbonyl group is trigonal planar. So here's our carbonyl. And remember, we use the word carbonyl a lot like an adjective. So we can say carbonyl oxygen, carbonyl pi bond, or the carbonyl carbon. All of these are valid ways to use the word carbonyl. Um, the only way I don't want you to use a carbonyl is if I ask you, you know, what is this functional group? The answer is not going to be carbonyl. So there are some functional groups that we already know that contain a carbonyl. These include the aldehyde. So remember the defining feature of the aldehyde is that the carbonyl carbon has to have at least one hydrogen attached to it. If there are two hydrogens attached to it, so a hydrogen instead of a carbon group there, it's a specific aldehyde called formaldehyde. For a compound to be a ketone, the carbonyl carbon must have two alkyl groups attached to it, and they do not have to be the same. So remember, R prime means that these two R groups do not have to be the same alkyl group. A carboxylic acid has a hydroxyl group attached to the carbonyl carbon. So this is not an alcohol, it is a hydroxyl group. An ester has an alkoxy group attached to the carbonyl carbon. And the important thing about this to remember is that the alkoxy group is attached to the carbonyl carbon through the oxygen, not by a carbon. And then the amide is going to have an amine attached to the carbonyl carbon. So these are carbonyl containing functional groups so far. So this brings us to what is definitely the most important thing for you to remember about carbonyls. Anytime you look at a carbonyl, I want you to recognize a couple things. First of all, there are two lone pairs on the oxygen. And then the second thing is that there is a resonance form for this molecule where you can take the pi electrons and put them up onto the oxygen. Now, when you do that, you're going to end up with a single bond between the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen is going to end up with three lone pairs, which gives it a negative charge. And the carbonyl carbon is now going to be positively charged. So this tells us a lot about the reactivity of carbonyls, uh, because if this is an existing resonance form, then both of these structures must be contributing to the true nature of the molecule. So another way that we could draw this molecule would be to imagine kind of a half bond for that double bond. And remember that there's going to be a partial negative on the oxygen and a partial positive on the carbon. Now remember, of course, this bond is actually very real, right? That is actually a double bond, but this tells us that there is a dipole along this molecule where the electron density is focused on the oxygen. So what does that tell us about the reactivity of this molecule? What this tells us is that if the carbonyl is ever going to uh, be introduced to acid, it's going to get protonated on the oxygen because that's the more negative atom. Uh, if we were to introduce a nucleophile, a nucleophile is going to be interested in the carbonyl carbon because it is the most positive of the atoms. So this tells us a lot about how carbonyls react.
So this brings us to the reactions of carbonyl compounds with nucleophiles. Now, before we get really specific and talk about you know, new nucleophiles, uh, we're going to look at this in a really general way. So this is a generalized nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group. So you have a nucleophile and you have a carbonyl. We just talked about this, right? The nucleophile is going to be more interested in the more electropositive carbon than any other atom in this molecule. And when it attacks there, the carbonyl carbon already has four bonds to it. So you can't just make another bond between the nucleophile and the carbonyl carbon without breaking one of those bonds. So we're gonna take the pi electrons and push them up onto the oxygen. And when we do that, we end up with a molecule where we have three lone pairs on the oxygen and a negative charge. This should kind of remind you of the resonance form that we just looked at a little bit ago. We have a new bond that was created from the lone pair on the nucleophile to the nucleophile itself. And then lastly, remember in OCHEM, we never leave our products as charged species. So we would introduce some source of protons at this point so that we can protonate the oxygen. So even though oxygen is electronegative, most atoms don't want to be charged at all. So then what that would give us is a final product that is an alcohol. So let's look at the overall change of what has happened here. We start off with a ketone. The ketone would be sp2 hybridized, and that would make it trigonal planar. Our new functional group, we went from an alkoxide in our intermediate, and we protonated it to get an alcohol. What would be the hybridization of this carbon? If you said sp3, you would be correct. And what would be the molecular geometry of this molecule? Hopefully you're thinking tetrahedral. So we've made some pretty serious changes to this molecule by doing a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl carbon.